Good morning, everybody. I will uh, give you today a return of experience on um, development that we are doing uh, at the moment uh, on uh, an application uh, that deals with embedded video. And we have, uh, I will explain why we have chosen to build the application on a dual architecture based on a Linux uh, process, uh, processor running embedded Linux and an FPGA. So you have all my contacts here on the slide. So before presenting quickly my company and myself, uh, just uh, a slide for the license. As I regularly say to the customers, don't forget to put a license file with the software. So I apply it to, uh, to myself and uh, I generally put a license on my, my slides. So it would be Creative Commons, so you can reuse it as you want. So ju just a quick uh, introduction to my company, uh, which is named CIO System Embarqué. We are a, a small team of 16 persons dedicated to embedded solutions. The company was incorporated in 1990, so a long time ago. We are working both on electronics and software developments, and we have started uh, working with Linux uh, at the very beginning of the, of the century, in 2000, and we are uh, expert in this uh, area since 15 years. We also uh, use uh, very, very intensively Open Embedded and Yocto to build our, all our distribution. The company is based in Saint-Etienne. Uh, myself, I come from Marseille, where we have a little representation. And we are an embedded Linux expert for the Captronic program, which helps French PME to, French SME to build a, uh, software, embedded software and electronic solutions. Myself, I am, I am responsible of the embedded Linux technology in the, the company. I am an embedded Linux trainer. Uh, I have worked in this world since uh, 30 years, at the beginning in, in the Unix world and now in the Linux. I am developer and maintainer of Yocto layers and uh, kernel and U-boot ports for the ARM boards that we develop. So uh, a word on the, on the need for the embedded video application. Uh, one of our customers wants to have a, to develop an application with high performance video acquisition, with uh, real-time treatments and real-time display, and with uh, big constraints on, on, on the video. The idea was to merge and synchronize two images issued by two different cameras. And uh, this application is deployed in a device that has uh, safety, safety constraints regarding to, to the video. And uh, due to the safety constraints, uh, we have uh, made the, the choice that uh, I will explain. Uh, the maximum authorized latency between the, what happens in the real world and the display on the, on the final screen must be un, under 20, 200 milliseconds. Another hard constraint is that the video must be available at most five seconds after power on. So we have to boot and establish an image and uh, the image must be stable set, uh, seven seconds after the, the power on. Uh, when we get these, uh, these requirements, it was clear that we will develop the device on a ARM architecture base due to our skills in the, in the ARM technologies and the embedded Linux. But why do, you, do you, we choose to use also FPGA? So we have, uh, we have already experience in developing video application on IMX6 processors, and we generally use JStreamer to, to manage the video pipeline. But these applications are not critics' application, just for entertainment. So we, there is no problem to, to use a, only a just streamer based solution. The problem of such an architecture 
is that when we will deal with the certification process, the safety certification process, I think it's not uh, imaginable to, uh, to certify uh, a world Linux distribution. It will be too, too work, too, too complicated. So that's one, one reason to trigger a FPGA-based solution. The other point was the real-time performances. Here we have, we have a constraint on the video performances and we were not very uh, confident about latency and jitter of such a solution with uh, just Linux and JStreamer. So we have decided to share the application between two processors. The FPGA will be dedicated to the real-time video processing and uh, all that is configuration, errors monitoring, all the utilities will be done by an embedded Linux distribution on the ARM part. The hardware platform that we have retained, it's based on a system on module. It's a, a Pico Z board that we, we take off the shelf. And then we've de we have developed the base board by ourselves uh, to deal with uh, all the interface with the cameras, to deal with all the form factors, the external connection, the, the power supply, and so on. So the Pico Z, it's a system on module that is based on the Xilinx Zinc 7000 all programmable uh, SOC. And uh, so within the, the SOC, we have a dual core ARM processor and a FPGA in the same chip. And in the, in the Xilinx uh, naming, the ARM is called the processing system. PS, so at the end, uh, on the other slide, we, when you see PS, it's uh, the ARM processor with the standard embedded Linux distribution. And the FPGA is called the Programmable Logic PL. What will be the Linux software environment of such a platform? When you, when you buy off the shelf the Pico Z, you have uh, two proposals for the distribution. The main proposal is based on Peta Linux. It is a Linux environment that is uh, the standard uh, environment proposed by Xilinx. And you have also uh, WinRiver Pulsar Linux. WinRiver Pulsar is a Yocto based environment. And you have a, a Wind River Postal Linux that has been ported to the Zinc arch architecture and the, the Pico Z. So, when we started the project, the question why will, will, you, will uh, we choose Peta Linux or Wind River Pulsar Linux? In fact, we choose a, a third solution because as we have a great experience of embedded Linux and of embedded, uh, open embedded and Yocto, Peta Linux, we didn't want to go into a new build system, even if it is uh, well documented on, on the Xilinx wiki and so on. It is normally it's a reference, but we didn't want to go into a, a new kind of tools. So naturally, as Wind River Linux uh, is a Yocto based environment, we have uh, evaluated it. But finally, we didn't go in that direction because in the, in the uh, layers of Wind River Pulsar Linux, uh, there is a, a containerization solution. And I, when we looked at that, it seemed that it was difficult to, uh, to ignore the containerization solution. So, because we didn't want to lose time uh, due to the build system, uh, we finally uh, decided to uh, assemble all the Yocto layers by ourselves and basing the development on the MetaXilinx layer 
That is, roughly speaking, the board support package for the, for the PicoZ ecosystem. So what we have done is pick up the MetaXilinx uh, on, the, on the, the Git. I think it's a, a Git uh, that is hosted by Xilinx. We have picked up all necessary layers from Open Embedded Layer Index. So if you, if you go to Open Embedded Layer Index, you can search for each machine and see what is available. Uh, in fact, we use, I think, Open Embedded Core, Meta Open Embedded, and so on. And that, that's all. And Meta Xenix. Of course, when you assemble these uh, layers coming from different uh, gits, you have to ensure the coherency of all the layers. So what we generally do is uh, we, we design a, a, a file that will, a manifest that will be used by repo, and repo will ensure the coherency of all the layers and uh, get it automatically, and uh, so you are, we, we are sure that everything is online. At the moment, we are working with uh, the core base. So finally, we have uh, made the Yocto-based build system that is tailored for our embedded distribution. Uh, at the contrary of uh, if we, we choose, uh, we have chosen uh, the Wind River solution, then we, we, uh, we were afraid that getting a lot of things that we, we don't worry about. So the, the embedded part, the embedded Linux part, is built by customizing Yocto receipts and creating new ones for uh, uh, the in-house application because uh, we, as I mentioned to, uh, earlier, we have an application to uh, <coughs> configure the video processing and the video pipeline and this application is uh, uh, an in-house application. Uh, when, we, when you look at the, the layers, the main thing is that the metal Xilinx layer, that is mainly a BSP layer, it's more complex than with our other uh, machines because of the interaction between the PS and the PL. I will detail later how Yocto and the BSP manage the interaction between the, the two parts of the, of the architecture. Uh, for the FPGA developments, uh, I'm not a guy uh, that is very uh, happy with FPGA because for me it's something a little strange <laughs> between the hardware and the software. But our engineers that are, that are FPGA engineers uh, are using um, an Eclipse-based tool that is released by Xilinx. It's called Vivado. And from the Vivado tool, finally, you can describe the final hardware you want for the PL part, but also for some, some parameter for the PS part. And when the guys from the FPGA developments have finalized their platform definition, then you can go to the Linux part and start to worry about how can I discuss with the PL part, how can I uh, manage the hardware and so on. But as long as FPGA developers have not stabilized, defined the platform, uh, Linux software people are stuck. They, we, because we don't have a platform that is completely defined. The, the platform will be defined only when people have uh, designed all the architecture in the Vivado tool. Uh, Vivado is a tool that works both on, on uh, Windows and Linux, and uh, there it has a great, great uh, scripting capability based on TCL. So, roughly speaking, everything that can be done 
for the, the, the graphic interface can also be done through scripts and TCL programming. So when, when the FPGA engineer have finished to design their, uh, their hardware inside Vivado, then the final VHGL code for the FPGA is generated. But for the PS part, how can we interact with this PL? We, of course, we don't want to have two parts that are not able to communicate and synchronize and so on. So there is an, an interface that is designed to communicate between the two parts. It is called AXI, and you have different uh, capabilities for the AXI interface, where you can stream data from one part to the other. You can share memory. You can exchange things and so on. So the main, the main point is that you can manage from the Linux part the hardware component that are designed in the PL part. I, I have uh, three use cases that are real use cases. For instance, we need three serial lines to communicate with distinct devices and the, the ARM processor has only two serial lines. So what they do is in the, in the Vivado tools, they take an IP for a serial line, they put it in the design, and then after that, we, from the Linux side, we will see three, device, three, three serial lines, two that are implemented by the ARM processor, and the third one that will be implemented by the, the log programmable logic, but that will be available to communicate from the Linux part. Another, uh, another, use, that, uh, another use case that we have, uh, we create additional GPIO in the PL part, and this additional GPIO allows us to uh, give to the, the Linux uh, application uh, status of the embedded video treatment. So we have, uh, we can just, uh, as a, a normal GPIO, export the, the GPIO, then look at it, and if it's z zero, then the, the embedded uh, video treatment is okay. If it's one, there is a problem. We can all also, from the Linux part, we can modify some strategy in the video pipeline. For, in, for instance, we crop the image, we, we change, when we assemble the two images, we crop the image, we change the position and so on, and these parameters come from the, the embedded Linux application, the, the in-house developed application, and is then transmitted to the, to the IP in the, in the PL, and the, the, the embedded uh, video treatment pipe, pipeline is uh, uh, managed from outside. Okay, so we are at this point, we have roughly seen the application constraints, the selected hardware and the software arch architectures and the tools. Now let's go into details of the technical parts. First, the boot mechanism. The boot mechanism is a little more complex than with a, a, a current ARM processor. First, the Pico Z needs a first stage bootloader. It's called FSBL before U-boot, so like a, an SPL in, uh, in U-boot. All the FSBL code is generated by Vivado according to the design. So when the FPGA engineer has stabilized their design, Vivado will uh, generate the FSBL code, and this code can be compiled either from Vivado or externally with an ARM toolchain. The problem, little problem, is that the ARM toolchain is based on ULIB. So uh, as we use uh, Krogot, 
in Krogot, we don't have support for new lib, so we must use a, an Ubuntu uh, cross compiler that is based on new lib. Then FSBL starts U-boot, and then U-boot starts Linux, uh, like every, every, every time. Regarding the FPGA, the FPGA code, that is called the BitStream, it must be loaded by FSBL or by U-boot at each start. On the Pico Z, if you don't uh, load and program the FPGA, the device won't boot. So at each, each start, it's the job of the FSBL or U-boot to download the BitStream from the boot device and then to program the FPGA. Uh, so you can't imagine to have just the FPGA make its job alone because that, that won't, uh, won't go. There is another problem that as the VHDL is reloaded at each boot, the VHDL code is about four megabytes. So it's, uh, it has a little impact on the boot time because at each boot time you have to read four megabytes and then program the FPGA. You, when working with certain architecture, you have to work with a founder-specific Linux kernel, as uh, it generally appears in the ARM uh, ecosystem. And inside the, the Xilinx Linux kernel, you have dedicated drivers that are uh, specialized to manage the resources, the hardware resources that will be implemented by the PL ex exported to the PS. And how, how is it done? In fact, these resources are appended to the device tree because Vivado automatically gener generates a PL.DTSI that is a file that is dedicated to represent all the devices that are in the PL and won't be managed by Linux drivers. So that's another reason that you have to have a hardware that has been completely de defined because uh, by, by finalizing and stabilizing the, the hardware, then you can output the PL.DTSI for the Linux kernel. Here is an example of a PL for DTSI uh, that we use. So here, uh, this is uh, additional uh, serial line. And uh, you see here that it's compatible with XPS UART Lite 1.00.a, that is uh, the specific driver for the, the serial line implemented by the, by the PL. And another, that is the GPIO I've mentioned a, a few slides before. This is the video status, that is a GPIO with uh, a Xilinx X XPS GPIO 1.00A driver. So in the, in the Xilinx kernel, there are a lot of drivers that are dedicated to uh, the resources, the hardware resources that can be uh, implemented by the PL part. In fact, Vivado generates the whole device tree, not only the PL part, but the whole part. One is the Zinc uh, 7000.dtsi, 7, that is just for the, the ARM part then the PL.DTSI for the PL part, and a final system.DTS that will include these two, two include files, but also not customization according to Vivado design. For instance, uh, we use SPI to, dis, to uh, uh, exchange with the cameras for the configuration, and the speed of the SPI bus is fixed inside Vivado and then automatically generated in the system.dts file.
Research your process. Every time the FPGA guys change something, you have to uh, rebuild all the, the device tree. So as generally FPGA guys want to change things, <laughs> so you have, it's a good idea to automate the process of taking the output of Vivado, putting them in the DTS, and then rebuilding the image. But thanks to Yocto, it's, uh, it can be done with a, a little work, but it can be done. Mainly, U-boot and device tree recipes are impacted by changes in the Vivado design. A few information about boot time optimization. So we had a requirement of seven seconds max after power on to have a, not, not only the image but completely stable because in the certification process they look at the image, they look at the luminance and you must have something very well established uh, and this has to be done uh, in seven seconds. So there is a, a lot of tasks before having the image. First, the FSBL. The FSBL is not very large code, so no, not very, very long to execute. Then you have the U-boot. Then you must load the bitstream from the, from the boot device and store it in the FPGA to program it. Then you have the kernel initialization. Then you have the user land startup. So in, uh, our meta, we are based on system five in it. Then you have the camera initialization and you have a lot of register to send to the camera for SPI communication. And then you have the FPGA video IP configuration in order to resize, crop the image, assemble the two and so on. At the beginning, we were about 12 seconds 12, 13 seconds. So we had to cut the image arrival time by two. So to, to gain six or, six or seven seconds, we must use this technique and add all the techniques to, to arrive at the final time. So the first one was to activate boot stage report to see where time was spent inside U-Boot. The FSBL, there is nothing to do. It's a very compact uh, primary loader, so nothing to gain. So first, act activate the boot stage report feature of U-Boot, and then uh, optimize U-Boot to minimize uh, the units of the peripherals. Then use a boot chart to identify where we spent time during kernel and uh, user land startup of Linux. So we have uh, deeply optimized the uh, Linux kernel, sometimes two. <laughs> uh, this this reduces the uh, media access time and then the peripherals in it. We have gained uh, about one or two seconds by suppressing uh, console outputs. First, uh, suppress, uh, redirecting output to dev null, but later on, uh, removing the console support inside the kernel. Because even without uh, console output, because they are redirected to dev null, we, spare, we lose about 0 0.5 seconds due to the initialization of a console system in the kernel. Then we had to completely reorder the init scripts to start the application as early as possible. So uh, we had to uh, make happens on a lot of basic services in New York too, to delay the start of the, of the network, uh, a lot of things. And finally, as our users are not very polite, they don't make a clean uh, shutdown, they just power off. And uh, at each boot, we lose about 1.4 seconds just to uh, 
check the file system consistency and, and have the file system uh, clean. So we, we gain this time by using a read-only file system. And finally, we maximize the uh, SPI speed on the uh, SPI bus for the cameras. After about two or three weeks of efforts, we now arrive to have the image after 5.6 seconds. But it was a great task. As I have told at the beginning of the presentation, we have safety requirements and we have chosen an, arch an architecture to put Linux outside of the safety requirements. But Linux is a, the Linux distribution is there for, for, for configuration, for monitoring, and also for installation and updates. And all the installation of the software and the updates of the software are done through IP communication over Ethernet. So, we have the FPGA software that will be under safety requirements, and this FPGA software is updated through an, an Ethernet channel. If we don't do something, it will be difficult to justify that uh, we are still safety if someone can hack the, the IP uh, inside the, the, the FPGA. So we have uh, used asymmetric cryptography to uh, sign and authenticate all software elements before installation or updates because uh, even if uh, Linux won't be uh, involved in, in safety requirement, in safety certification, we can't afford to have a, a, a channel that will uh, go through, through the embedded dis distribution and enable the hacking of the, of the FPGA part. So a few conclusions. The project is still under development. It's not, uh, at the moment, it's not uh, finally delivered. At the beginning of the project, we had taken two major de decisions. One was to use a mixed design based on embedded Linux plus FPGA. The first time I have heard from the, from the Zing from a customer, and the customer told, asked me to develop an embedded Linux uh, based on Yocto on this FPGA, on this architecture. I was not very enthusiastic because of the plasticity of this architecture. For me, uh, it was not clear what, well, what will be the device I will see from, uh, from the Linux part. So when we entered uh, this project, we were not very confident of uh, such an architecture. I will uh, give my conclusion on the, on the next slide, on this point. And the other decision was to use the MetaXe links and assemble the layers by ourselves instead of using the proposed standard solution. So the results. The concern regarding the dual architecture were about split design. What will be the communication facilities between PS and PL? And how will the kernel be able to manage the peripherals that are in the PL parts? It's clear that when you split a design between two CPU, and if, if uh, it's two ar different architecture, it's, uh, it's harder. It's, but the advantage that we had for, of using the FPGA for video treatments are more important than the drawbacks we have encountered. That's clear. Because to, 
to be able to go on the certification process, I think there was no solution on a, on a single Linux uh, uh, distribution. Thanks to the AXC interface, we have a lot of paths to communicate between PS and PL. And the good quality of the drivers in the, lin in the Xilinx kernel and the automatic generation of the device tree finally make things very easy to, to manage uh, what is uh, implemented in PL and has to be seen from Linux. And the thing that, I, uh, that we have discovered uh, by using the, uh, the ecosystem is that finally, with the PL, you can easily adapt your platform to new needs, or perhaps, for instance, we had a, 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 some debug GPIU for the development and then remove them for the, for the final uh, delivery. So we have a, a platform that is very adaptive uh, to uh, requirements. Regarding the choice of meta links, having worked with a lot of uh, meta BSP, I think that the meta links is of, of good quality. Uh, some meta BSP are not so good. But meta links, there is no problem. Just one thing is to understand the logic, the structure of the BSP, because due to the impact of the exported DTS from Vivado, it's, uh, it's splitted. For instance, the device tree is not built by the kernel. Normally, when you, when you build the kernel, you build the device tree. In, uh, in the meta beginnings, the, the device tree is a part. And when you work on the Pico Z, you have another uh, receipt for the platform in it. So you have a lot of uh, receipts for the, for the BSP. You must understand the structure. Then uh, you, you can use it without trouble. The other point is that we select exactly the layers that we need. And so we have a distribution that is well tailored to what, uh, what, what were our, our requirements. So finally, I think it's uh, an interesting ar architecture. Uh, if you have some guys that are um, happy, that, are, that, that do know how to use uh, and program the FPGA, it can be a very uh, plastic solution to share and try to have the best of the two worlds. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for, it, for your attention. And if you have questions, I try to answer. Um, maybe you said that, but I missed it. Uh, why did you use an FPGA? Mainly for the safety requirements, because the product must be certified. It is a, a, a critical product, and have an embedded distribution certified. I think not possible. So the just the, the VHDL part will will uh, be certified, and the Linux will only deal with things that are not under certification constraints. Okay. okay, thanks. And the other, the other point also, because we, we must have a very, very regular and real-time video processing pipeline, and it was a, a guarantee with the FPGA, we know that an image is, there's a pipeline and it's very, very regular. You, we can, mix, we can synchronize the, 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 inside the FPGA. Everything is uh, very, very uh, sure and very, very precise regarding time, regarding synchronization, and so on. But what, what I must mention is that we, the video uh, core processing is a commercial IP. We have not developed the core of the processing. It has been bought off the shelf. And what we have developed, it's all the periphery, all the configuration, 
and so on. And what does it take it as input and output, the video peripheral? Sorry? What, what does it take as input and output? Uh, we, we have two, two cameras with a, a numeric uh, bus that uh, give us the video input. Then it goes inside the video core processing and then it outputs to uh, standard uh, screen uh, backlights. Okay. And uh, the Linux part is some kind of configuration, monitoring, and utilities. Okay. Have you ever considered running the wall application inside the initial RAMFS? Because it has many advantages, because it doesn't require anything else, the bootloader to access the root file system, because only the, root file, the bootloader will load it. And the other advantages is that you can run several versions in parallel, because if you boot one or the other unit RMFS, you run into another system. And it's also easier to check some if you want to, to check the integrity of the root file system. You just have to check some of the RMFS on it. Done. So, in fact, um, on, the, on the hardware, uh, you have two different boot devices. One is a QSP flash, and the other is a EMMC. So uh, what we have done is we have an, an initial RAMFS inside the QSP flash, and this, it, uh, it, inside this initial RAMFS, we have the installer and the updater. And the other, the other parts are on the MMC. And what we do is that we have, uh, we verify, we have a manifest to verify all the checksums of every part. This, uh, this uh, checksum is signed with asymmetric uh, cryptography based on OpenSSL. And uh, at the moment where we install or we update, the, the initial RAM system check all the components before writing them on the, in, on the EMMC. And uh, what, our, our root FS is too big to fit on the, on the QSP flash. And the, EM, the EMMC is not, uh, is not able to be programmed by GTAG. So what we do is uh, we, by GTAG we flash the QSP flash and after that we install on the EMMC. And uh, due to the size of the bitstream of the of the all the components, uh, our our root FS is too big to fit directly in the in the QSP flash. Okay, thank you. Um, far from being an FPGA expert, but is it possible to use the AXI uh, interface to program the to exchange data with the FPGA instead of using the GPIO? Yeah, because for instance, uh, the parameters, the parameters for the from the for the video processing will. Uh, I'm not also an expert of FPGA, but uh, uh, the parameters are, uh, will uh, come from the Linux part and uh, through the AXI interface go inside the IP and to parameterize the uh, crop size, uh, etc. Uh, uh, we will also uh, make some communication uh, over the serial line, for instance, uh, there will there will be a serial line between the the PL part and the PS, and we will exchange data over this serial line because the serial line can be seen from Linux, but it can also be uh, managed by the PL part. Um. Why did you choose to use uh, Linux on the on the PS? I mean, more than uh, something smaller or something homemade. Mainly because as soon as we have evacuated the constraint to the PL port, for us it was quite natural because we we do use Linux since uh, 15 years, and at the moment. 
uh, low-level engineers were thinking about using bare metal. But uh, if you use bare metal, how do you make a TFTP request to download the image? How do you uh, have implemented a FTP uh, server so that the customer can uh, update things? Uh, how do you have uh, open SSL cryptography support and so on and so on? It's so as long as we have evacuated the constraint to the PL part, uh, we, do, we do use Linux and on ARM and uh, Yocto since years, so it was quite natural. Okay. So uh, I have a question, but maybe first I can answer the question regarding the AX, AXI bus. Uh, in fact, it's a bus which is used to connect hardware components at, at VHDL level, and uh, one component could be memory, so FPGA can access to memory, and uh, normally uh, you memory map your components to memory accessible from the PS, from the processor, so you access your memory like you, uh, you can access everything in the, in the FPGA like it is a memory, and it's super fast. It can be super fast, so... so and the, the video memory, the video processing memory uh, for the FPGA is taken from the main memory, it is taken from Linux and re and uh, given to the FPGA processing. So it's shared between the processor and the... And my question is, I, I was not there in the, in the beginning of the um, of your presentation. The product you make, it's, it's something which you which you sell or it's a prototype which will be industrialized by someone else? Uh, uh, how, how it's something we develop for, for our customer that, and that will be uh, deployed in the automotive field. Okay. And that's the reason why there are some safety constraints. So my my question now is how do you handle the the, the asymmetric crypting? How, where do you store the key on the device? And is it a, a one key per device or is it a generic key? No, at, at the moment, uh, I think that uh, in the in the embedded field there are a lot of people that are not very aware of security and cryptography and so on. So at the moment, it's a pure initiative by us to secure things. Because for me, it's not convincible to have an open <laughs> access to uh, upload the FPGA uh, software. So the, um, 